After working as project architect for OMA's giant CCTV tower, architect Ole Scheren stepped out of Remco Han's shadow to set up his own practice in China. His current projects include a Kuala Lumpur skyscraper with a four-story high tropical garden slicing it through the middle and a pair of Singapore towers uh, uh, that curve around public plazas. Working in Asia has brought him a certain fearlessness and vision for the future. It's a dedication to what the future may be like without the fear of losing something. Please welcome the Lord of Towers, Ole Seren. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, of course, there could be, no, could be no greater letdown to you than to bring an architect on stage at this point of the conference, uh, because everything we do is slow, is boring, is imposing, is uh, non-human, is unsocial primarily. Uh, we, we work for people with a lot of money for autocratic regimes, and it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of difficult to follow up on everything. Uh, if, what design can do, of, of course, almost only bad. Uh, there, there was a single cue in, in the entire previous uh, rundown. Somebody just said housing. So there's a bit of hope I can latch on to that uh, and, and see what we, what we can come up with. Um, of course, uh, we're in the business of uh, imagining environments for others. Um, and uh, we do that with utmost perfection, as we've heard. No designer can ever make a mistake, even though they may swear to uh, whichever promises um, that, that you were just made to sing. Um, singing may be a good cue into this one. Uh, it's eternal happiness. And of course, everything we do is only for that. And every architect that would stand on stage would uh, tell you a perfect story of how their design is for perfect life. If we go a little bit back in history, architects had uh, great visions how to modernize the world. Um, this was an idea uh, by Hilbesheimer for Berlin. Um, and that's all uh, part of the last century only. Um, Corbusier, as, as you all know, had uh, this idea for Paris. Um, and also, to Tokyo was a little bit more exciting uh, somehow than Europe never quite, quite made it there. Of course, that's why I went to Asia, because you can see uh, the possibilities are a little bit uh, wider. Um, actually, the, the, the Brits had, had probably the coolest idea still. It was not just like buildings growing wildly, but it was buildings um, walking um, like pigs uh, through in even New York, uh, the entire world. Um, that, of course, got all too wild, so the Americans put the lid on. Uh, Buckminster Fuller uh, either protecting humanity from itself or from the environment that they had polluted already then. Quite a visionary uh, moment um, seen where we are today. Uh, but of course the, the, the issue is serious and the challenge is serious. Um, since not so long, I'm sure you all know, more than 50% of the entire world's population lives in cities. And there's an issue that cities get denser and denser and that uh, with ever greater numbers of people uh, sharing an uh, ever smaller space available, uh, architecture in a way is uh, facing a big crisis. Um, these are pictures all taken in the past uh, uh, 10, 13 days uh, on, on my travels. This is Hong Kong and this is simply the reality of, of Asia, a picture of Shanghai um, and a photograph of Tokyo. And of course what you can see uh, very consistently is that this environment um, is not um, dictated by um, visionary uh, invention and a particularly uh, controlled sense of space, but primarily, uh, sorry, back one, uh, but primarily by, by something that is purely vertical, it's the tower. The tower is the only form that seems to uh, allow and propagate density, uh, density of human uh, inhabitation, and uh, the ultimate consequence um, of the urban urbanization we talked about. Now I want to take you to uh, one particular place uh, in Asia um, and begin um, our observations there. Uh, Singapore, um, a small city-state, um, which since many years uh, either uh, ranks on top or very close to the top of another uh, great chart, uh, the most livable city in Asia. Now, what does it mean, a livable city? If we look at Singapore, it looks kind of like this. Um, it's a lot of towers. Uh, if you look a little bit closer, it's still a lot of towers. Um, and if you start to look even closer, you realize like may maybe one or the other tower is a bit better, the other one a bit worse. 
But essentially, these are all buildings that have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Everything is built uh, for its own right, uh, in its own place, by a different client with a different interest. Um, but actually, the relationship between these buildings no longer really exists. So since private money um, dictates and dominates almost the entirety of uh, architectural production today, uh, we ask ourselves, what is left? Now, if you look at this image, it doesn't look that bad. And why does it not, not look that bad? It's simply because there's this green glue. Singapore is a tropi uh, tropical place. They have an incredibly beautiful and powerful nature. And that sort of fixes everything, like green glue um, that, that holds the whole thing together. But if you would take that away, you would, you would become much more acutely aware of the, the kind of disjointed uh, nature of these cities and also of the fact that these buildings have no longer anything to do with the question of how we live together. At best, they may answer the question of how you isolate yourself in a vertical silo, um, but not really um, how we could create a space that has something to do with community or communality. I want to start with a project uh, located in Singapore, actually not in the very center, a little bit outside, part of a huge green belt um, uh, of this tropical uh, city-state. And um, as the client uh, came to me, um, they said, we want a very large uh, residential development, 1,040 apartments, um, and we have a 24-story height limit, so could you please uh, build 12 towers of 24 floors? And, and of course, this was a highly attractive uh, proposition, so I immediately said, yes, I'll do the job. Um, and, and then I went back and said, like, are you really serious about that? Because, of, of course, if we look at this, um, th these towers have very little to offer. First of all, uh, th they're sort of mostly all the same as the rest of the, the city. Um, there's very little space in between, so privacy is uh, at a minimum. Um, but also the space on the ground is nothing but residual. And are we really serious about like, pretending to build a mini, like a mini Manhattan? If this was in a very dense part of the, of the city center, maybe uh, one would need to work with this. But where we were, I thought we should really think differently about it. As I started the project, I found um, uh, really by, by coincidence a postcard that had been written exactly 100, uh, 100 years prior. And I, I gave that to the client and said, like, look, this is actually who you were. And they, they looked at this and said, like, mm, OK. <laughs> and I said, like, yeah, you see, if, if, you, if you look at this, uh, of, of course, it has not much to do with our reality today. But one thing that you can see very clearly is that when you were still a fishing village, there was a textuality in your physical substance of the city that had something to do with community and with the way in which people would live together. Now, today we want all the privacy of our apartments, we want the individuality, but ultimately we see that we completely lose a sense of togetherness. And I said, can we not try to find one in the other and in a very abstract sense re-evoke uh, uh, almost uh, a concept of a vertical village? So I said, why don't we just topple the towers that we actually just looked at, throw them on the side and pile them up? And at first, it looks like chaos from the side. But of course, it's not only spatially uh, exciting, but what it does if you look from the top, and this was the first design drawing, it was about creating space. It was about creating space that would be shared by the inhabitants, about a structure of a building that would be interconnected, and we called the project the interlace, um, to really express a sense that while you are inside your individual apartment, and by the way, by adopting these hexagonal courtyards, we could actually double the distance um, of two facing buildings compared to the towers. So it gave us more privacy on one hand, but it also gave us a lot more space and spaces for the people to share. So this is a view of these, um, in a way, modernist housing blocks gone wild, stacked on top of each other. And you can see these courtyards are by no means um, kind of cordoned off. They are not enclosed spaces, but they are open and permeable. And then we went to program them with um, a whole series of natural gardens, identities created mainly through landscape, through the idea that outdoor activity, and we're here in the tropics, so you have to realize 365 uh, days of the year, people can actually spend time outside, not only inside. And we created these, these huge uh, gardens that uh, almost became 
the identity of where you lived. So there were places for children to play, um, there are huge water parks, and even the fire truck route that we need, of course, in case of a fire for the emergency vehicles to arrive, I simply turned into a running track. So everything we needed became, in a way, a desirable addition, uh, additional quality for the uh, inhabitants. We did a lot of work um, with the environment, studied the sun paths um, to prove that every apartment and every uh, point of the, of the development would have sufficient daylight. But more importantly than that, also looked at um, how we could reduce the energy consumption of the building by optimizing the facades according to their solar exposure. But by solar exposure, you of course also create shade and that in return became the most important quality to control the, the microclimates in the outdoor spaces because of course in the tropics, unlike here, you're really happy when the sun shines, but there you're trying to find shade uh, in order to uh, be able to use uh, outdoor spaces. Uh, in combination with that, we placed a series of water bodies along the prevailing wind directions so that the evaporative cooling of the water would further reduce the temperatures in those tropical gardens and really make them livable and uh, enjoyable. But I think what socially remains uh, really the most important uh, quality of the, of the whole strategy that we employed here was the idea that you would create a stratified and layered space that ranges from highly public and communal to more and more individual, to give a variety of environments that as you live there, you can, you can explore and use from the most private to the most shared. And I think the richness of that uh, is really what, what ultimately creates, I think, the true value um, of the environment. Um, also by uh, greening the terraces, because we have basically turned the vertical into the horizontal and stacked them up. So we've multiplied the horizontal surfaces uh, that were available. And if we simply count the leftover green parks on the ground, plus the major roof terraces that all become public gardens, we have 112% green of the site area. So more green than not having built a building. And that of course was another multiplier effect um, that both translated into uh, uh, e economic functionality, but ultimately into the quality um, of what is available uh, to the people there. So here you see a photo under construction, and uh, this is the aerial photograph from the helicopter, and you see how uh, the, these courtyards uh, basically speak for themselves. This is a, a view that I think shows the, the kind of incredibly detailed intricacy of all the spaces there. Um, and I think one of the really most uh, exciting things about the, the project is that we realized this for an incredibly low budget. So it's actually affordable housing. A young family, uh, two kids teaching at university can afford uh, to live here. So people actually also do live there. And this is something that is another battle in particular in this part of the world that more and more uh, um, buildings get bought up for speculative reasons and nobody lives in there anymore. So it doesn't matter if what you design is actually good or not. You live the illusion as an architect that you actually do that. But the truth is things are bought to be resold. They are bought off plan. So before they're built and nobody really cares what it is. This is, by the way, the 13th floor. Uh, and this building is technically still a skyscraper. It's a 24 story building. It's just no longer vertical. So you see, this is one of these roof, uh, roof gardens that create in a way new datum planes. You have a view to the skyline of the city in, in the back, uh, and you get a sense for the, for the drama and, and, um, variety in a way of, of things you can experience in this, in this place. And I think really psychologically, when you go there, you suddenly understand that wherever you live in it, there are so many places you can disappear to. And I think that in itself is something we, we start to lose completely. We design everything for control, but where are the spaces that we can, in a way, escape to or escape from? And where can we find, in a way, a sense of, of freedom uh, in, in the things we do instead of determining everything um, by design? Um, a second project uh, that I want to show um, deals um, with a more inner city uh, situation. Um, it's very interesting because it's the first ever joint venture collaboration uh, between uh, the countries of Singapore and Malaysia, two, two places that are historically not very close. Um, and the, the prime ministers got together, settled a long-standing land swap deal, uh, and did their first ever joint venture development um, on a site. If you look at the site, it's this 
piece of green patch, no man's land, between probably the two ugliest buildings in Singapore, um, which was basically declared unbuildable uh, and empty for a decade. Um, so, so nobody knows exactly if this was a good deal or, or a bad deal, uh, the, the outcome of that. But essentially the question was how could you build a, a building in, in this location? And you see very clearly here again embodied the, the observation I mentioned before, that buildings are built absolutely without context to each other and without any responsibility towards the public realm and the urban realm. Um, the city uh, foresaw that you could, so you, you can see, of course, this is the, the central site. This, whoops, sorry. The, this, this is the zoning proposed by the city. You could build two chunky towers that would in some ways um, only make everything worse instead of everything better. Uh, in plan, it looks like this. You see the stripy buildings here at the bottom, the pointy ones, and the little slab, this brown building, and those two chunky volumes um, that could be placed in the middle. And I thought, instead of always thinking of architecture as an object, as something you only conceive as a standalone piece, could we think of it, in this case, as something that is there to in this case, repair an urban space or create urban spaces. So I started to carve a series of spaces away from this allowable mass of buildings to generate two different footprints, a more slender one for the residential uh, part of the development and a deeper floor plate for the offices. Um, but ultimately, the strategy was to co-opt those ugly neighboring buildings into a new urban ensemble to create two very distinct uh, urban spaces and silhouettes and plazas that would no longer read as a kind of disjointed uh, accumulation of pieces. But you can see here with the curvature of the building that in a way uh, uh, joins uh, the existing pieces into a very precise new set of urban uh, space uh, and, and urban place. The idea was then um, to, uh, in a way uh, as well, sculpt the two towers, that of course there's a dual reading, they're both generators of space, but they're still readable as objects uh, simultaneously. And there was a bit of this kind of symbolism, of course, in, in those, those two things and what they do with each other. I, I spoke um, when I was presenting the project to the, uh, to the governments, um, I said, you know, this, this, this is almost like you guys, it's an odd couple uh, that can't quite decide how to how to come closer or dances around each other. And this, this, was, this brought exactly like a very, very silent, nervous chuckle, uh, because of course no one had ever said that. Um, but at the end, everybody was very happy that it was not only super serious, but that there was a kind of positive sense of how the coming together of these two towers um, would ultimately have a synergetic effect on the surroundings. A quick uh, historical discourse, when Palladio designed the Villa Rotonda, he had, a, he had created um, a very explicit formal challenge or problem. He had, he had designed a square building, but he wanted a perfect a dome and cupola, a round space in its center. So what he came up with was um, a wall that could thicken or thinnen according to what he wanted to create so that the spaces themselves were perfect. Um, we often call it today poche. And in a way, the building, if you like, is, is almost an urban adaptation of that. I'm using the building to contain all the functions that we need, the housing, the offices, but I'm using it to create uh, um, uh, explicit spaces in the urban realm um, and the building, uh, in, in that sense, no longer a standalone piece, but really that contextualizes itself uh, to repair this uh, specific urban uh, part. The building, furthermore, is then uh, interwoven with uh, a direct connection to public transport, to the bus station, the subway, uh, and really uh, works as a connector and civic uh, nucleus to bring everybody together. And even the higher levels of the building at the very top of the towers, public spaces are made uh, accessible to the, uh, to the city. Um, to bring everything together. You see the ground, it's a 24-hour, in, in this part of the world very often projects end up gated. They're open to a certain, for, for business hours and then they close off. And I made a deal with the client that um, I really wanted this to be something that was there for the city and open to the people. So we designed a system of natural ventilation, a 24-hour open ground permeable, accessible at all times. And you see it's almost a sense of a kind of streaming of, of water or streams of circulation that traverse a big garden uh, activated with restaurants um, and uh, cafes and, and public amenities. So the buildings really dematerialize as they come to this public ground um, and form these uh, uh, huge courtyard spaces 
that then really uh, can become the center for uh, the local communities of office workers to eat the elevated terraces, again, accessible in gardens, uh, uh, swimming pools, and all kinds of recreational facilities um, of the project. We're under construction, actually. We're now about 10 stories out of the ground, and it's uh, one of the projects rising. These were the two prime ministers happily announcing uh, that it was um, that, that sort of architecture had brought them closer together. Um, a building very briefly I'm uh, doing in Bangkok. Um, some of you may know Bangkok. It's a, it's a very crazy city. Actually, every building in Bangkok is it's either a robot building, an elephant building, a UFO. So a everything is there. And you have, if, if you come there, you realize there's absolutely no chance to ever st stand out or to ever be special. So the client saying, like, I want a building that is really different from my city. I said, OK, so we do something that's absolutely nothing. We just extrude a square, and that's probably the most different you can be. But of course, this, this really uh, exemplifies the problem with the tower. It's, it's nothing. It looks the same from everywhere. It's a little bit taller or not, but it actually makes no difference. It has not much identity. But most importantly, I think it has no more scale. It's completely divorced from the city, disjointed from the life of the people, and you can't see, is anybody actually inside this building or is there any life in the building or not? And I think this is what makes our cities look more and more dead. So I thought, could we not think, could we not open this mute shaft of the tower and erode it, or could we not think of a building that's almost unfinished, that's, that's simply not, not quite complete yet, like the Tower of Babel almost? So I, I eroded this kind of pixelated uh, structure that, that was the idea of bringing the small scale of the, of the historic city that is around it up into the tower, and in a way the human scale, so what looks unfinished and almost destroyed from, from afar, if you zoom closer, you realize it's space for living. It's terraces, uh, living rooms, projecting uh, surfaces that allow you, for example, on the 17th floor to have a 35 meters uh, terrace um, uh, out in the sky. Also, where the building comes to the ground, it, it bleeds out in these uh, open terraces to create an animated public space that is all about dialogue, and it was really the idea that the life of the city could ascend on the building, uh, uh, up the building, and that you really sense that the people living in the building become what the building projects as an image back to the life of the city. At the very top, 314 meters, uh, if built in Europe, it's a little bit taller than the Shard, uh, just as a, a context. It would be the tallest uh, here. It's the tallest in Bangkok. We're making an observation deck in an open sky bar um, with a 360-degree view. And all of that was a sense of trying to involve the life of the people and the activity of the people to give that back. This is a, um, an image a few months ago, and this is where we are rising currently in the city. Uh, and I know I'm already over time, but I very quickly still want to go back to, of course, um, what the whole talk was also introduced with this building uh, that we built in China. That was, of course, also a question, what could uh, architecture do, or also what could happen to architecture? It was probably the most uh, radical statement in terms of how we could subvert a skyscraper uh, by instead of going purely vertically, taking the needle and bending it back into itself, into a loop of interconnected activities that in a way, if you look at it almost with an X-ray eye, uh, you see it's an organism um, of, uh, of, of a highly complex system uh, of interactive pieces. If you dissect that, these are the main technical clusters um, that are intertwined with social clusters. So really the idea that the technical functionality of the building and the social life of the workers and inhabitants would form a singular complex system that follows the loop of the structure and exploits the system as a huge collaborative uh, concept and system rather than one of vertical uh, demonstration of hierarchy and power. A few images from the inside. Um, we also, this is the direct link also to the subway station. Um, almost 5,000 spaces uh, that we created. This is a canteen um, at the top of forum, the offices, and the broadcast control room. This is China's national broadcasting station. This is actually double-sided and a bit of a James Bond bad guy moment uh, when, you, when you imagine, of course, what they do there. And they can um, broadcast 300 television channel, channels simultaneously. 
uh, from this building. It's uh, by far the largest uh, media installation uh, on the planet. Um, this is the building as it stands in Beijing now, um, operative, um, a few views of how it has uh, maybe changed how a building can interact with space, how dramatically it can change its reading uh, as you move around it. And you see those three little circles at the cantilever uh, far. Um, these are small pieces of glass in which you can enjoy the vertigo uh, of the city 160 meters below you. It's since become uh, a part of the city uh, in, in many ways, full of contrasts and full of normality at the same time. There are a few spots where any time of the day you can find uh, at least five or six photographers uh, actually taking pictures. So it has become a whole economy uh, of itself. And of course, it has changed a lot of things in the city that suddenly had no longer that much to do with the piece, the building itself. It was used by uh, other property developers to advertise for their offices. And of course, any office with a view would charge one and a half times the price to any other office. Um, some of them um, built resort housing far out of the city, but you can see it lurking uh, across the horizon and the, at the top still, uh, strangely enough, with the World Trade Center in, in New York together. Um, so, some went uh, even further and put it into Shanghai Pudong and thought maybe this would also be a great advertising tool. Um, right next to the site, a wedding cake shop had engineered you know, Beijing is earthquake zone, so engineering is complex. So a, a whole wedding cake engineering took place um, to, to copy the building, and we, but we never found out who, who wed uh, on, on this, unfortunately. Um, there was a big internet poll of how this building should be called, and they decided for Dakucha, big underpants. <laughs> so all kinds of things happen that when you design, you're not quite... You know, it, it, of course, also had a very official role. It was part of the Olympic projects, and they were not so happy about the underpants story, as you can imagine. Um, but it, it, it was part of the symbolism of China's moment to open up uh, to the world. It was on the front page of the New York Times. Um, it got uh, 2012 um, the Chicago Award for the Best Tall Building, so there was a lot of serious recognition. But I think still the most important thing that the building did was maybe sort of embodied in, in, in this. This is a, a title page of something like uh, Time Out uh, for Beijing, um, where, where you see simply a series of characters and suddenly the building has become almost like a persona uh, in the play of the city. And of course, that opened a whole uh, new range of how to think about what design can do or what can happen to design when it's appropriated in other ways. And I think it most, its most glorious moment uh, was, of course, not this one, but that one. <laughs> when we were suddenly called and said, like, it's on The Simpsons. They, they had a competition for the uh, greatest icon and landmark on the planet, but uh, we, we lost to Taj Mahal. <laughs> so I want to finish with this project after all the scale, uh, something very small, um, a project that shows that it's not only about thinking in the dimensions of this architecture, but a few friends of mine uh, inaugurated a film festival uh, in Thailand and asked me to come and, and see what we could do. And in this incredible landscape, I said, if we want to see movies here, I think we have to see them floating on the ocean. Um, so I designed a floating cinema um, in the Andaman Sea um, that was made up of a, of a modular structure, uh, like a, a big floating raft. Um, we had absolutely no budget uh, and no means to do this, so I went uh, across the island to meet the local fishermen and said, what do you do that floats on water? So they took me to see their lobster farms. And it's a, a very um, uh, amazing system. They, they take old pieces of styrofoam that package their, their televisions, wrap them in mosquito net to protect them. Then a few wooden planks, cut up tires, tie the stuff together, and they have a five by five meter module of floating elements. And we said we simply adopt that. We worked with the local community on using the techniques and everything they did in a very different way to build this floating cinema that uh, afterwards also went back to the community. We watched uh, movies in this incredible uh, uh, natural setting. Uh, Tilda Swinton is there. She curated the movies together with Abhichat Pong. And it was a night, of course, of magic uh, exploration of a world hardly ever visible to the architect. Thank you. Do we stay? Hey! <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. First of all, I have two questions on Twitter from the audience, and they're all about the CCTV tower and the building. If it uh, will be, op be open again after the big fire, I didn't know there was a fire, but anyway. <laughs> no, the, the, the main building was never affected by the fire, and the main building has been open and in operation since 2012, but the neighboring building, there was a fire, uh, and that building should reopen end of this year. Okay. Well, then another thing, having been based in Asia, I thought when you come to Amsterdam, the, the, the scale of Amsterdam must be quite surreal for you. <laughs> well, no, of course not. I mean, I, I'm European. I, I grew up in Europe, and of course I'm still, uh, in a way, uh, very connected to that. But clearly what, what we've learned and experienced in Asia, I think, uh, has been an incredible decade of, of really enormously adventurous development. Um, yeah. and, and I think an interest and a readiness in the, in the question of the future that is, has not been asked as pertinently uh, anywhere else. And I think that was really a very exciting time, of course, for us. And also a certain fearlessness, you said. Of course, a certain fearlessness. Yeah, I mean, once, once you are asked to do, you know, the CCTV building is the, I, I think still until today, the second largest building ever built on the, on the planet. Yeah. And it's, th these are all things that f for us ourselves were incredibly hard to comprehend or even imagine as we were doing it. We, ha we had to work really hard. I mean, we did the initial stages here from Rotterdam, of course, from the OMA offices, um, and I basically had rented a whole new floor just for the team uh, of this project. And at some point I said, like, guys, come all together, let's stand here, let's look at our office floor. And now let's just imagine you're drawing this plan. You draw a plan and here's the core, the elevator core of the building, and here's your floor plate. Our office is the elevator core. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our office building is the, the size of the elevator core, and this is what we're doing. And so you really have to be sometimes that direct to comprehend what you're doing. But another thing, I think, is that in Europe we are really busy with the preservation. So uh, that prevents us maybe from forward thinking when, when, it, com when it comes to building. Do you, what do well, you think? I, I think forward thinking should not contradict preserving things necessarily. Yeah? Um, but I think, of, of course, Europe has an incredible substance to maintain, an incredible substance maybe also to develop further, but I think we have to be careful that that preservation doesn't turn into conservatism and that mm -hmm. there is still forward thinking in everything we do. And that does not mean always doing something completely new necessarily. Um, one more thing, because we have the design challenge here, and I thought, what do you regard as the most pressing social issue of our time that designers can help address? In, in, in a way, I find the question almost too big uh, to answer, but I, I would say in architecture, something that I mentioned before, uh, the fact that um, the, the majority of architectural production is actually in housing. Mm -hmm. Um, and the majority of that uh, is in the hands of private developers, and the majority of that becomes more and more subject to a speculative cycle that no longer asks, are the things we do really good for the people, and do people really live in them? And I think if we could design a system that kind of breaks through this, this lethal circle, um, I think that would be quite meaningful. Thank you very much. Ole Scheren, thank you so thank much. You.